Hey, welcome to Android Dialogues, where we have bite-sized conversations with people in the Android community. I'm Huynh Dwet Dow, and I'm speaking with... Shekou Famiswa. And we're currently in Denver for 360 NDEV. Shekou, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Uh, where are you based, and how did you get started in Android? Um, I'm currently based in Dusseldorf, Germany. Mm -hmm. um, I got started in Android a few years ago. Uh, I was doing a sort of internship. Mm -hmm. at with a company while I was in school. Yeah. And then my mentor asked me to try out Android. It was pretty new then. Yeah. Um, I was like, why not? <laughs> and then a few weeks later, I got my first Android phone. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've been an Android developer. Awesome. Do you remember what your first phone was? Yes, it was an HTC HD2. It mm -hmm. originally shipped with a Windows OS, but I hacked it and installed Android. <laughs> That's, that's like a true Android dev, right? It's like, yeah, we don't need this Windows OS. So we're in town for 360. Ashigan is speaking. Ashigan, what are you here to talk about? Uh, my talk is about Kotlin, uh, about um, some tips to, that are useful. For, for Kotlin, and it's one of my personal favorite subjects, and I know we talk about it a lot on this channel. Um, in particular with Kotlin, so you're talking about more intermediate con concepts, right? Yeah, intermediate. And so we were talking a little bit before, and I was really thrilled. And I mean, it's, uh, that's part of your talk as well, part of the the, the talk description, I was really thrilled to see that you're talking about some of my favorite subjects in Kotlin, uh, including imperative versus functional programming, right? Yes. Awesome. Well, for anyone who maybe not know the difference just yet, can you explain what the difference between imperative and functional programming is? Um, yeah. Um, so I'm, in, in loose terms, uh, imperative programming is when when you declare step by step um, what is how things are be do, being done. Mm -hmm. And functional on the other side is um, what exactly being done. And functional reads fluently, mm -hmm, and right. imperative is like step by step. Okay. That's actually one of my favorite words now to use when talking about programming in Kotlin, fluent, like the idea mm -hmm. that it, it reads kind of like high level. Yes. Like you can actually just, instead of yeah getting down to the real low level of step by step, you just say, hey, I'm doing this thing. Hey, I'm mapping a list or something. And exactly. I really like that. And I, I mean, I have to admit, like, um, I, I didn't think I knew the distinction between imperative programming and just regular programming for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I, I heard about functional programming. Like a lot of the folks, when I first uh, joined my job currently uh, at Trello, I know a lot of folks were really into Haskell and this functional programming thing, and I, I didn't quite get it. And for me, Kotlin was actually a really good time for me to really understand and kind of dig into functional programming concepts. Did, did you go through something similar? Yes. Um, I also, uh, Kotlin was my first, oh, second of experience of functional programming and I was always overwhelmed by the Haskell and all the other talks around. In terms of like getting into functional programming or I guess where does functional programming live in Kotlin? Like where do you see functional programming in Kotlin? Um, it's in a lot of the features of the language itself, um, the extensive collection framework yep. with, with all the filters, the maps mm -hmm. and all the operations that are possible and also um, in the Lambda functions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a key thing in functional programming languages that functions are first class citizens of the language and that is true with Kotlin. Mm -hmm. So I, I know like that term off, I, I hear this phrase a lot like first class citizens. Um, so what to, to you, what does that mean when a, a kind of something is a first class citizen of a language? Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'd say first class citizens of a language are like the things that uh, could be stored in a variable mm -hmm. like integers or strings. Yeah. Um, functions can also be stored in variables. They could be passed into other functions mm -hmm. and they could be returned from other functions. That's really, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's, and it's, it's one of my favorite things about Colin, but yeah. it takes a little bit to get, get your mind wrapped around it, right? Yep. And like typing functions and everything. Yep. If someone wanted to kind of say, just get started with functional programming in Kotlin, like what's the first thing they should do or what's the first thing they should read? Um, I think, uh, Kotlin in Action is a really good book. Yes. Um, yeah, it's good to get started. Uh, but besides that, you could also try some of the um, things on the on the Kotlin official website. It's really helpful, and it's it's uh, a rather easy le uh, learning curve. Mm -hmm. It's easy to get in. So you could just play around with the Kotlin commands, and then from there you could maybe try to read a to get more information. Mm -hmm. uh, but for functional programming, um, to be honest, I'd say I, I just Google a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's always, it's always a good strategy when you're developing, just yeah. Google a lot of stuff. 
Um, I, I know that I've been doing a lot of imperative programming, like my whole programming life. Uh, for you, what are the advantages? I mean, like, okay, it's like this fancy term, functional programming, and yeah, like other languages like Haskell have it. Like, what do you think are the advantages of actually trying to understand and, and be more functional in your programming? Um, for me, I would say, one, it's really easy to read code. Yeah. Um, it, with functional programming languages, it's super easy to read a block of code and be able to tell by reading at one pass, you can mm -hmm. tell what the code is actually doing. Mm -hmm. Unlike imperative programming where you have to really follow the blocks and they hear like, okay, if this happens and mm -hmm. this is what's happening, and it, yeah. it gets really confusing really quickly. Um, also, I, I kind of feel like just uh, as as you do it more often, you mm -hmm. kind of get more used to it. Yeah, no, yeah, um, just so, anything else. Yeah. In terms of like like functional programming, like if there were like two or three concepts or two or three like Kotlin specific things that you think people should try, like like maybe if you had to give someone an assignment and said, okay, you're gonna start functional programming, what are like maybe two or three things that you'd want them to focus on or you think that would be good entry points, I guess? Um, first one I would say will be immutability. Yes. So really get familiar with the concept. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the uh, key concepts in the in in, in functional programming, mm -hmm. and luckily for us, it comes out of the box in yes. Kotlin. Data um, classes, right? Yep, yes. data classes data and classes. in vars versus vars. Yes, um, I think that will be like the first step to actually understand the difference between a val and a var mm -hmm. um, to understand that. Classes should be final by default. Yes, um, which which they we, are in Kotlin, which, which they is, are is amazing. Yes. Um, if you had to do that in Java, you would have to specifically make your class final, but just declaring a class in Kotlin makes that happen. Um, that's the first thing I would say people should get familiar with if you want to get into functional programming with Kotlin. Mm -hmm. And then our next would be to familiarize with the Kotlin uh, collection framework. Yes. Because um, there are some really interesting functions and transformations that are really handy and could could become really complex. Yeah, I, I love that. And like, I mean, I guess if you're an Arcs Java type person and you're used to and love all the operators that you get, the collections framework is, and I, I think that was a really good entry point for me too, because not that I, I don't feel like I'm a super expert at Arcs Java, but I, I'd been learning it. Mm -hmm. And then to have like the idea of string operators, and like you were saying, it's it makes it more fluent, right? It's like, yeah. oh, okay, well, I'm mapping this, and then I filter on this, but mm -hmm. then I take this and I, fold into this like yes. yeah I, I i i that's one of my favorite things i think it, that definitely i agree it's a great starting point yeah. well thank you so much uh Shagun. um i know i know that all the talks are recorded at 360 so you should definitely like if you're like starting kotlin and you're kind of looking to take that next step if you're have heard about this thing called functional programming and you happen to be doing kotlin and you want to kind of figure out how to blend the two um definitely check out Shagun's talk thank you so much for joining me today thank you so much for having me oh it was actually a pleasure and i i, I can I, I mean i could talk to uh, Shagun about kotlin like all day but um i'll let him go because he probably has a, a talk to prep uh if people wanted to find you on the internet how can they do that um i'm always on twitter okay <laughs> uh you can find me at Shagun famisa Nice. S E G U N F E M I S A. Awesome. We'll put a little banner like that oh, awesome. here. But uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And thank y'all, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.